Hello fleet, and welcome back to another episode of Sail and Chat. And most of you probably looked at the screen and went, wait a minute here, this isn't World of Warships. It's not. This is Navy Field, and this is a game that I used to play, and I'm still quite fond of it. Although I don't really have as much time to play it as I did before. But it's a game I liked a lot, and it brought back feelings of nostalgia, which is something I kind of wanted this morning when I first woke up. So, you know, for those of you who are expecting a ship sailing around the seas, I uh, apologize. I want to show you a slightly different game today. But as I played Navy Field for all about two hours, the more I played it, the more I started to think about stuff. And the more I started to think about stuff, the more I started to think about, you know, potentially what World of Warships should learn from this game and also what things they should try to avoid. Because I think Navy Field, truth be told, I think the developers of this game tried really, really, really hard to to get the naval aspect of the game right. And I think they ran into many of the same problems that well, the Warships has run into in terms of, you know, whether it be balance or things like that. And I think the people in, like the people who developed Navy Field kind of thought about it, thought about it, thought about it, and eventually came up with what they thought was probably the best solution. And I'm not saying that they're perfect, I'm just saying that there's some interesting lessons to be learned here. Take for example, the current HP system in World of Warships. It's a very, very simplistic system, realistically speaking. You have this much HP, you take this much damage, and then you sink. Unless you happen to be in a high tier cruiser or a battleship, then you've got the ability to repair some HP. It's just a rather simplistic HP system. I think in this particular way, Navy Field's HP system I found to be significantly better. So Navy Field, you had the ability to have, uh, let's say, this whole HP bar. And then out of that whole HP bar, when you take X amount of damage, you only directly take about 10%, I think, directly to your HP. The rest of it is sort of like damage over time almost. And what ends up happening is that your HP gets burned off, but then you also have people who repair the HP back up. So this allows ships to be, well, to feel more like ships and to be able to really absorb damage. Of course, unless the damage was so overwhelming, um, you get sunk in one salvo, which does happen. But this kind of thing on Navy Field, these little things, World of Warships could learn from. And that could add a, a very, very different level of um, sort of complexity to the game. So, for example, the battleships right now who complain, oh, we're getting just instant nuked by all the carriers out there. Well, maybe a system like this could make their lives a little bit easier in terms of just having a chance to survive the initial wave and then maybe repairing a little bit and getting back in. Of course, that also means you probably have to take away things like the damage control party and those consumables and stuff. Not sure if that's going to happen because, again, that's kind of already been coded into the game. But it's an interesting hypothesis what World of Warships would look like had it adopted maybe something a little bit more along this kind of line. There are also things about um, Navy Field that I don't think was great. And one of those particular things was communication between the developer and the player base. Because the developers of Navy Field were Korean and they had a tendency of almost being a little bit wargaming-like in terms of just sort of being very distant at times and then sort of very um, they just weren't very easy to communicate with and so a lot of times players would offer feedback and suggestions and things like that or they would even tell them what things went wrong and you know eventually you see a patch and it's like wait we warned you that this wasn't a good idea and they kind of just did it so there's a lot of sort of things that I think uh, Wargaming can learn from here in terms of good and bad to hopefully create eventually the best game possible. Again, that's all hypothetical, so. Moving on from Navy Field, because I think I've talked enough about it. <laughs> Let's talk about actual World of Warships news. And it's been a bit of a light week in terms of actual news. There are a few things, though. One, uh, Wargaming is the official, one of the official sponsors for TwitchCon 2015. And they have a bit of an event going on for that, or it's a contest, sorry, not an event. There's a contest going on. Uh, they are looking to send 10 streamers from the US or Canada, and that's the only two countries that are eligible. Um, they're looking for 10 people to send to TwitchCon, which means they will be paying for stuff and sending people there. So if you're interested, uh, make sure you tweet out a bunch of stuff to them about you streaming um, with the hashtag sale to TwitchCon, and hopefully, 
you will get picked and they will send you. I know I'll definitely be entering because I do stream World of Warships exclusively and I would really like to actually go and maybe check out some stuff and maybe see some people, meet some people. Yeah, be a pretty cool experience. All right, so enough about that because, you know, oh yeah, by the way, if you, of course, if you want to check that out, the link is in the video description below. Okay, moving on to... Uh, actually one more conference news which is World of Warships will be at Gamescom 2015 uh, now I will not be there because gosh you know don't really have the money exactly to be uh, zipping across the Atlantic right now to go there however it's interesting because they, they said that they're gonna be doing some sort of open beta thing and I'm hoping that after Gamescom there's gonna be a huge influx of new players because, truth be told, the North American server, I think, is just, well, it's not really empty, but compared to the European server, it's a little bit light on players. Although, I wonder, you know, with an event that's actually based in Europe, whether or not, you know, the NA server is really going to benefit. But, hopefully there is benefits for the NA server, and we do get a few more players. Keeping my fingers crossed, and hoping. Okay, finally moving on to in-game related issues. New premium shop packages came out. And the minute they came out, they started, you know, selling flags in packages. And immediately there were accusations of, well, this is really pay to win. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, I guess it's, it could be considered pay to win. Because you're, you're purchasing flags that can give you a, a, a in-game boost of some kind. But on the flip side, if you can earn the flags through playing and actually getting the necessary medals and stuff and you know it's not hard it's not that hard to do um, the flag packs don't really have that big of a an impact otherwise because you know people can already get these flags and if they want to spend some money to get some extra flags don't really see it as that big of a problem you know on the flip side if they introduced uh, you know premium ammunition system cough cough where the only way to purchase it was with gold then I would say pay to win but in this particular case mm, I would say no I would say it, it's smart of wargaming to do this so that they could make a little bit more money from people who would like to purchase flags but mm, pay to win I would say no and finally one last thing to talk about today which is I go on the forums these days and I see people complaining about stuff being underpowered, overpowered, this needs buff, that needs nerf, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And while I agree some things need to be looked at, um, you know, the truth of the matter is the, whether something is truly overpowered or truly underpowered is quite dependent upon the captain who is commanding the ship. So you've, you, a lot of you guys have watched me play carriers. And I'm really good with my carriers, but I've been playing carriers since closed alpha, right? So for for me, carriers are like, you know, second nature right now and play them without much thought anymore. But for people who try it and it's like their first time trying it, they're like, holy crap, this ship is a whole lot harder than I thought it would be. And that's what makes the difference, really, the, the, the player skill. For example, I can do great damage in tier 9 carriers. I've seen another captain in a tier 9 carrier with an average damage of like 45, 50,000. So that gap is, is purely due to skill. Other ships can also have battles where they're very, very consistent and they do great damage and they help their team win. And that is also based on skill. You can also have ships that just YOLO and die. So I, I think people really need to really need to sort of calm down a little bit, first of all, with all the nerf, buff, OP, underpowered, whatever threads. And really give the game a chance for people, one, to learn how to play, and two, really to get up to the higher tiers. So take, for example, right now, at the higher tiers, all the cruisers are like Atagos. Minimal AA, and as a carrier, if I'm there right now, I'm stomping everything, nothing to be worried about. But if this was, let's say, a time when everybody else had their tier 9s or tier 10s, and all of a sudden I'm going up against, you know, half a team worth of Des Moines or Baltimore's, uh, I think I'd be a little bit more worried about their A because they will shred my planes out of the sky. And for those of you who don't believe me, give it time. When you get there to tier 9s and tier 10s, you will see what I mean. Okay, and that's it for news. Let's move on to viewer questions because, hey, some of you have questions, and I've got some answers for all of you. And the very first comment of the day is one I feel like I need to address because, well, I saw two people who made similar comments, this being one of them. The other one was, I don't think as harsh, but this one, this one hit home and it hit hard a little bit. 
So Leather Redneck here came in and he said that essentially he came in to check for World of Warships news and received a bunch of useless crap information. Okay, Leather. First things first, at the beginning of every sale and chat episode, and pretty much right at the beginning, I generally talk about World of Warships, and as soon as I can, I'll start talking about World of Warships news. That's like the first thing in every episode, so you don't really have to watch the rest of it to get there. Just gotta watch the beginning parts, and as soon as I sort of finish updating about the most recent happenings and the news, I move on to viewer questions. You don't have to watch the viewer questions if you don't want to, it's just a way for me to answer questions because there's a lot of them right now and it's, it's overwhelming to try to reply to every single one of them by typing in the YouTube comment section. So I'm doing the best I can, I'm putting it into video. As for your complaints regarding the, you know, the car troubles I was having or the potential diet I'm on, okay, fine. You know, you don't have to care about those things. It's, just, it's my personal life. It's something I decided to share with, you know, everybody. But if you don't want to listen, you don't have to. You know, you're free to just turn it off and go do something else. But there is one thing I've got to say to you. And that's regarding the, the whole use of unskilled labor to maximize t-shirt uh, sales profits. Wow. I think my girlfriend would be quite heartbroken to hear that, to be honest. You know, she's doing this because she really likes this community as well. She thinks you guys are awesome and she wanted to do something for all of you. And, and I said, look, I would like to do this, but I don't have the artistic capacity to do it. She offered to help voluntarily. And for you to come on here and to essentially say this is, is pretty damn mean-spirited, my friend. So, you know, hey, you don't have to have a t-shirt, right? You don't have to ever buy one in your lifetime okay there's I'm not holding it against you you don't have to but please in the future keep these comments to yourself moving on from that comment that left a horribly bad taste in my mouth MLG games I'm gonna answer this question for you how do you play the low tier American destroyers like the Wix well the the low tier American destroyers I think you really have two purposes one uh, use your guns really really to really use your guns to deal with Japanese destroyers so almost act like a destroyer screen for your team. That's the first thing. And the second thing I think you should really do is like sort of look at the map, analyze the map, and find where you can ambush Torp from. So find the places where there's either the narrow choke points, where there are islands you can hide behind from, and you can pop out and drop torpedoes on people. And actually, that's pretty much all the American destroyers, all the way from tier, you know, pretty much from tier 2 all the way up to about tier 7. Uh, once you get to tier 8, that's the first time you're able to essentially stealth torp like the Japanese destroyers. So that's something that you should really keep in mind. You know, use your guns, deal with Japanese destroyers, and then ambush torp other stuff. Hope that helps. Brofisticus asks, do I need any more replay footage or am I already swamped? Well, Brofisticus, uh, if you have a replay, just send it in. Um, I am, what I tend to do at least uh, for every Nautical Tales episode, is I tend to watch all the replays and I try to pick out sort of like the best moments from the whole pile so if you've got good replays send it in I'll take a look at it um, you know probably in the future when it really does become overwhelming um, then you know I'll probably have to figure out a new way to deal with it then but until then if you've got a replay send it in seducing jackal actually sent in a very very interesting question he wants to know if anybody knows what the green and red squares are on the ships usually on the bridge deck or in the front of the ship and seducing Jackal, I think I have an answer for you. I think what you're looking at on the, the ships, uh, on the models, the, the red and green things, they're called navigation side lights. They're basically used to help ships, um, you know, essentially avoid collisions with each other. So, you know, if you do a great, like a Google search on navigation side lights, uh, you should find more detailed information regarding that particular thing on the ships. Kim DeWith asks, uh, will you ever do a face cam? And my answer to that is maybe, but probably in the future, not right now. Um, still not comfortable with the idea of having, um, you know, uh, a face cam, but maybe one day in the future when I'm more comfortable with it, I'll do it. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Mikey Adalbert asks, why did they remove the minimum arming distance on plane drop torpedoes? Uh, Mikey, I can pretty much assure you that the minimum arming distance is still there and it has not been removed because I'm pretty sure if they did, I'd be the very first person to realize when my carrier torpedo planes were able to, well, basically drop torpedoes with zero arming distance. If you don't trust me though, you can always go and get yourself a carrier and give it a shot and see what happens. Next question comes from Alex Mensa, who asks, well, actually, more as a suggestion, I think. 
um, if I would ever consider doing some kind of uh, custom battle, um, like a Montana versus 12 Hashitates or something. Yeah, Alex, that sounds like a pretty good idea. I think I'll give it a go someday. Uh, maybe on another weekend stream, perhaps. Moving on to our next question from Fanru Yi, who asks, um, those shirt designs are cute. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And then he asks, uh, why don't I let my girlfriend appear on my shows and say something about what she thinks about the game? Well, Frank, um, you know, while I've got relatively thick skin and um, I can sort of deal with the people on the internet, uh, yeah, I don't think I really want to expose her to that yet. So, you know, uh, sadly she won't be appearing on any shows. Her contributions uh, will be mostly offline in the form of things like t-shirts and stuff like that. Our next question comes from Yoning Zhang, who asks, uh, any tips on the Colorado? And he describes playing the Colorado like driving or commuting in Toronto um, or taking the transit system in Toronto and then he says his overall experience has made him as mad as Rob Ford. First of all, Yoning, um, gotta say, <laughs> you managed to put three Toronto jokes in one to describe a ship. That I have to give you props for. That was actually pretty funny. It cracked me up a little bit. Um, in terms of practical advice for the Colorado, here's just a little bit of advice that I can give you um, for this particular ship. One, I think the Colorado performs better as a support battleship rather than a battleship that just pushes ahead, you know, leading the way. So the reason why I say that is because one, if you fully upgrade the Colorado, the AA is actually somewhat decent. It's not terrible. And you're able to deal with some of the enemy planes that come near Colorado and you can kind of shoot them down. The second is you're not bad as fire support. You've got those 16-inch guns. Well, you know, the spread and everything is kind of bad. They do have the capacity to hit, and they can penetrate the armor of even higher-tier ships. So kind of, I think, what you could do is find the other slow American battleships on your team, the New Mexicos and whatnot, and sort of group up with them. Because remember, at the, your top speed is all very, very similar. You get together with them, and then sort of just support them. The New Mexicos off, uh, obviously t have a tendency of doing a lot more pushing because they have a lot more guns. So support them. You know, After they engage and after they get engaged, you sit there and you lob some extra 16-inch shells. If you see planes coming in, you, you, know, you prioritize helping the battleships um, with your AA guns. So, yeah, I mean, I find that with the Tier 7 American ships, even the, um, what you call it, the Pensacola, it was the same thing. She's not very good off sort of conducting her own independent actions. She's a much better ship if she is sort of just supporting the team, sort of supporting the pushes. And, you know, so far when I play it as a support ship, I have a lot better luck. And when I play her as the, you know, I'm going to lead the way kind of ship, I get killed pretty quickly there as well. So hopefully that advice helps and hopefully your results get better. So do let me know if things improve for you. Next question comes from Max Thornton, who wonders which particular carrier line should he bother with? Um, well, Max, um, my advice to you is probably just to start with the Japanese carrier lines. And the only reason why I say that is because Japanese carrier lines generally have more bombers, which means that if you want to learn to bomb, it, that's probably the better line to start with because the American carriers are absolutely unforgiving if you don't know how to bomb because they only get one torpedo bomber squadron and in most cases one dive bomber squadron if you at least want to keep one fighter squadron so you know start with the Japanese ones learn how to bomb once you learn how to bomb and learn how to bomb well then you might want to consider going to the American carriers because then you at least will know how to hit that one squadron effectively hopefully this advice helps again you know if you feel more closer to the American line just because you can always go there like and, and learn there it's harder but it's not impossible Revirk Jelvin asks which do you think will be stronger the Bismarck or the Tirpitz well Revirk I think the Tirpitz should be stronger and the reason I think that is because the Tirpitz compared to the Bismarck was relatively speaking a slightly later ship which means that I'm guessing that a lot of the problems that maybe the Bismarck had or whatever would have been rectified by the time the Tirpitz came around, at least historically. So if that is the case, then in game, you know, you should see that same sort of reflection where the Tirpitz being the slightly later ship would generally be better than an earlier generation ship. Hopefully that answers your question. Our next question comes from Jamie Mudd, who wonders, how come I only see one plane in a squadron? Well, Jamie, that's because on the lowest graphic setting, um, there's a thing called animate small objects that's turned off. That animate small objects thing, had you turn it on, you would see the required number of planes per squadron. But otherwise, if that's off, you're only going to see one. 
It helps if your computer is not really the greatest, but if your computer can handle it, you might want to consider turning it on. Joel Gonsalves asks, if I get to test or just happen to see some of the new ships that Wargaming is testing, can I show you guys? Um, well, I can tell you that they are working on it to get me some of the new ships to um, basically show you guys. So when I get them, um, you guys will see it. Hey, Freaking Boom, um, you have another question and hopefully I've got another answer for you. First things first, uh, you really like the Bismarck t-shirt. Awesome, yeah. Uh, we're trying to work on that t-shirt more, trying to get it perfect before, um, you know, we're trying to revise it to make it as, as, as nice looking as possible. Anyways, your question is, when do, you, do I think Wargaming is going to fix your mistake and put in the Yorktown class carriers? Um, well, huh, it's a hypothesis and it, it's because, you know, so far I've seen Wargaming put in like the worst bite and in the near future the Bismarck and the Turpets as premiums. And, and sort of all the well-known ships are, are coming in as premiums. Um, my guess is that we might see the Yorktown slash Enterprise come in as a premium ship. So, you know, I'm not 100%, but it's just a guess. So, you know, who knows, right? We'll have to see what Wargaming decides eventually. And our final question today comes from Mikhail Angel, who asks, uh, what is exactly going on with his Wyoming? Because what he's found is that his Wyoming has difficulty penning battleships at long range. And so what he's resorted to doing is using HE at that range, and then as he gets closer, switching over to AP. And he's, you know, wondering if this is just, you know, how all battleships are. And Mihal, what I can tell you is that I think the Wyoming is more the exception to the rule than the rule itself. Um, it's the exception. Uh, it's got 12-inch guns, which don't really have the world's best penetration, especially against other battleships. They're fine against cruisers, but against other battleships, they can be lacking a little bit. And how World of Warships works is that the closer you get, the better your penetration, which means that, hell, you can penetrate battleships you know, up close and personal with even 6-inch armor-piercing, mind you. So with the Wyoming and the way it is, it's not great at long range, so you might want to just sort of keep yourself angled uh, and then sort of close the distance before switching over to AP and just blasting everybody away. However, once you get up to other battleships like the New York, the AP will have very little problems penetrating other battleships. So hopefully this advice helps and hopefully it improves your games with the Wyoming. And that pretty much wraps up this particular episode of Sail and Chat, although today we kind of sailed on a different sea. Um, of course, if you've got any questions and stuff like that, please leave them in the comment section below. I will try to address them in the next Sail and Chat episode. Of course, I think in the next one I will probably be going back to World of Warships. Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed today's particular episode and you enjoyed a little bit of time that I spent in Navy Field to see just what a slightly different naval game looks like. Aside from all that, you all have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you all on the high seas.